Okay, very good. You are listed as uh, University of Nottingham, USA. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, that's a little bit far west for Nottingham. As uh, yeah, I didn't. <laughs> the trains would never get there if it was that far. No, they, they, they have trouble even um, to get to the place where Nottingham is at the moment. Okay, right. Welcome back, everybody, for the second session uh, for today. And it's my pleasure to start off with Kay uh, Brantner. I will, it's very difficult for me to interrupt when, when I'm not in the room or attract attention when you're not in the room. So if you can aim to stop as close as possible to 11 minutes past five UK time, then, then there should be plenty of time for questions. A couple of minutes over is not a big disaster. Ele 11, so I have 30 minutes to talk. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you That's very much. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, um, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for setting up this beautiful workshop and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, and I would also like um, to thank the organizers for making it possible to um, switch my slot with tomorrow, which is the reason why this talk is a little bit misplaced in this session. And I will actually talk about uh, quantum thermodynamics. Nonetheless, uh, I hope you will find that interesting. So I will speak about our um, journey through permutation invariant uh, quantum many body systems that we undertook together with Benjamin Yedin and Benjamin Morris, both of whom have a background in mathematics, which is why this talk is going to be a little bit mathematical. Um, so let's get started. So the subject matter of this talk are predominantly non-interacting open quantum many-body systems. And to have something concrete in mind for the beginning, we might imagine some lattice of two-level atoms. And these atoms are coupled to some environment. And we imagine that um, the relevant modes that couple to our atoms have a characteristic wavelength. And for the moment, this wavelength is supposed to be smaller than the area that our system is occupying. So in such a situation, um, it is relatively straightforward to write down a microscopic model. Yeah? I mean, the system Hamiltonian is really just the sum of the individual two-level Hamiltonians, and then there is some interaction Hamiltonian with the um, environment that we don't even specify further here. And the crucial bit is um, we assume here that the coupling operators of the environment, which are the operators B in this expression for the interaction Hamiltonian, do still depend on the position of the atoms in the lattice. So that means um, the system Hamiltonian is obviously invariant under all permutations um, of two-level systems here. So that means the system Hamiltonian commutes with any permutation operator. But the interaction Hamiltonian is not which is why this is not um, a permutation invariant system in the way in which I will use this term in the following. But nonetheless, one can now convert this microscopic model um, into a quantum master equation by following the standard steps of a weak coupling, more Markov approximation, and in the end, a rotating wave approximation, which is not a problem here because everything is non-interacting. So the energy levels of the system are actually well spaced. So, well, and then we get um, a simple quantum master equation, which essentially describes um, decay of the individual um, two level atoms. Now, if we imagine a situation where all the atoms are initially in an excited state, and we would measure the intensity of the radiation that comes out of the system as these atoms decay, we would see a relatively unspectacular exponential decay. So much um, for this. And now we can make the situation a little bit more interesting by bringing these atoms closer together so that they occupy an area that is comparable or smaller than the wavelength of the relevant modes of our environment. So in this situation, um, we can neglect the position dependence of the reservoir coupling operators 
so that we can rewrite the interaction Hamiltonian in terms of collective spin operators, yeah, which are just the sums of the individual raising and lowering operators for the two level atoms. And as a result, now also the interaction Hamiltonian with the bath becomes permutation invariant. That means it commutes with any permutation operator. And if we now feed this microscopic model in our, into our standard machinery, we get a collective master equation where instead of individual Lindblad operators for the um, two level atoms, we have Lindblad operators that act on all of these atoms simultaneously. So this structure has striking consequences. Yeah, if we would now do the same experiment and prepare all the atoms in their excited state and then monitor the intensity of the emitted radiation, we would see that initially not terribly much is happening. And then there is a sudden outburst of radiation and this peak scales um, in height with n squared and the width of this peak scales with one over n, n being the number of atoms. So this phenomenon is known as um, a superradiance, and it is a consequence of this collective structure of the master equation here. And this in turn follows from the fact, so I will try to argue, that we have a permutation invariant system here. So these kind of um, effects have, over the last years, attracted quite a bit of interest in um, quantum thermodynamics. There's a very nice recent experiment on a quantum heat engine driven by superradiance. And then there's um, a fair amount of theory work. So this list is not meant to be complete. It's just here um, to illustrate that these kind of systems are attracting considerable interest. And I personally think that they are interesting because they give us a possibility to learn something about the role of collective quantum effects in quantum thermodynamics with, without having to deal with all the complications that come from interparticle interactions. And there are um, interesting effects, superradiance being perhaps the prime example in these systems, and therefore I think it's worth studying them. So we now go through this literature, um, one will notice that it almost exclusively, not quite, but almost exclusively, focuses on ensembles of two-level atoms or effective spin systems. So the question that we were asking initially is, how can we actually describe such ensembles of non-interacting permutation invariant um, quantum systems if they have a more complicated structure? Yeah? So for instance, we might assume that we have um, three-level atoms or four-level atoms, and then this um, level structure might not match a, a quantum spin, and then it's not a priori obvious, at least, um, what we would have to do. So, and this is what we have tried to investigate, and one might think that all of that is basically textbook knowledge, and to some extent it is, and it turns out that uh, high energy physicists and mathematicians have done a lot of work to put together the, the group theoretical methods that make it possible to describe these systems so elegantly. And what we have tried to, to put together these methods and to see how we can use them in quantum thermodynamics and what we can learn um, from these tools in this thermodynamic context. So I will try and, uh, and go through the, the, the mathematics a little bit. Um, I will only scratch the surface, really, of all the, the group theoretical background, and I will, in certain places, sacrifice mathematical rigor in favor of keeping the notation light. Uh, but if you find that interesting, then um, please have a look at the paper, and we, we made considerable efforts to try and explain these, these things as pedagogical as possible. So let's get started. So the first ingredient we need um, is the Lie algebra. SUD, and for practical purpose, this is just um, the set of Hermitian D by D matrices with vanishing trace. Now, because the set is also vector space, uh, we can expand any element in the set in some given basis. And it turns out a useful basis is the so called Cartan basis, which consists of diagonal generators and off diagonal generators. 
So the diagonal generators, as the name suggests, are diagonal matrices with vanishing trace. They are Hermitian, and they obviously commute with each other. Fine. And then we have these off-diagonal generators, which can always be chosen such that the commutator between any diagonal generator and any off-diagonal generator returns a scalar multiple of this off-diagonal generator. And the scalar in front may be zero. But if it's not zero, that basically means that the off-diagonal generators are ladder operators on the spectrum that is generated by these diagonal generators. Cool. So, I mean, what does this mean in, in terms of SU2? So in spin language, it means we can write any um, traceless operator on a spin space as a linear combination of sigma z and sigma plus minus. So sigma z half here is our only diagonal generator, and then sigma plus minus are the off-diagonal generators. So far, so good. So now we can try and make this a little bit more complicated um, by assuming that we have n identical copies of this algebra. Yeah, so now we have n particles, and each particle is described by operators drawn from this algebra. And then we can construct collective generators um, in this way, simply by extending each individual generator to the entire Hilbert space by multiplying with a lot of identities and then adding them up. So these quantities are permutation invariant, obviously, and they just correspond in SU2 to the collective spin operator SC and the collective raising and lowering operators S plus minus. So this is really just a, a generalization of, of what is well known from, from spin physics or more generally angular momentum physics. Fine. So these operators now, these collective generators, satisfy the same commutation relations as their single particle correspondence. And therefore, they form a representation of this Lie algebra on a higher dimensional space. And this particular type of representation is called the tensor product representation of SUD. Yeah. So that's basically what um, I wanted to say about these generators. And now we can go on and use this language to construct our master equation. And that goes as follows. We now assume that our system Hamiltonian, so we, we can assume that we are in a basis where the system Hamiltonian is diagonal. So we can expand our system Hamiltonian in diagonal generators and then assume that the interaction with the bath is mediated by the off diagonal generators and some bath coupling operators, which we do not need to specify any further. Also here now, obviously everything commutes with any permutation operator. So this is a permutation invariant system. And now we can convert this microscopic model into a master equation again, and to this end with the weak coupling and for Markov approximations. And then we also want to apply a rotating wave approximation to get a Lindblad equation out. And to this end, we have to decompose these off diagonal generators in the individual frequency components. That means we write every E mu now as a sum of components. And each of these components is a ladder operator with respect to the system Hamiltonian. And if we do that, we end up with this master equation down here where the gamma mu nu form a Hermitian matrix, which is positive semi-definite, so that this is a proper Lindblad equation. There is some lamp, sh lamp shift, which I have absorbed here into this uh, effect of Hamiltonian. And the lamp shift is also diagonal, commutes with the system Hamiltonian, and therefore can be expanded in diagonal generators. So now we have constructed this thing. And now the question is, of course, what can we do with it? And um, how can we analyze this equation? And it turns out to this end, the so-called shore vial duality is a very useful tool. And this is a statement from representation theory, which has far-reaching uh, consequences. Um, as far as we're concerned here, it tells us the following. Yeah? So we consider um, a product Hilbert space Hn, which is composed of n identical copies of some finite dimensional Hilbert space. And now the statement is, this Hilbert space has an autonormal basis in which all permutation invariant operators, i.e. all operators that commute, 
with any permutation operator are simultaneously block diagonal. And moreover, so that, um, this is implied by this expression here, and moreover, we can now label these blocks systematically. And this label lambda here is a compound label. It consists of D numbers. And each of these um, set of numbers represents a decomposition of N, i.e. the number of particles, into D, i.e. the number of levels, integers. And we furthermore require that this, um, this sequence is non-increasing and that every integer is positive or non-negative. They can be zero. Fine. So and the O lambda now is a block in the representation of this op uh, operator O, and it acts on some subspace of our product Hilbert space. And one can now go and calculate uh, the dimensions of these individual blocks, and there is a formula for uh, this dimension. And what I mean, the formula itself is not so important. The important thing is that it exists. So one can systematically calculate um, the dimensions of these blocks and their, uh, their multiplicities. That means the number of times a given block occurs in this decomposition. So to make that a little bit more transparent, we may apply this theory to SU2, so again to angular momentum systems. And here our compound index lambda has only two components because the sum is fixed that effectively translates into one degree of freedom. So we can define a quantum number j as the difference between these two um, indices divided by two. And this j can take values between zero and n half if n is even. And then if, if n is odd, then you have this um, half integer sequence. Fine. And now you can, for this situation, construct the sure basis that block diagonalizes the permutation invariant operators explicitly. And that's nothing else but the usual DK basis. Yeah. So the j is, of course, our usual total angular momentum quantum number. And then you need an additional label for these states, which is the magnetic quantum number. And then one can go and calculate from the formulas that I've just shown you, the block multiplicities and the block dimensions. And of course, that returns the um, result that we already knew before. And on the left, there's just a little graphical illustration of what all of that means here. Yeah? So that's supposed to be a matrix representation of the permutation invariant operator in this basis. And you see you have a series of blocks and the dj is the dimension of the block j and the mj is the multiplicity of a block with a given j. Fine. So now that we know that, um, we can further decompose this master equation. Yeah? The effective Hamiltonian and all the Lindblad operators are permutation invariant and therefore they can be decomposed into these, in, uh, into these um, sure while blocks. And if our initial state is also permutation invariant, then we can also decompose it in this way. And then this block structure is preserved and therefore the state will remain block diagonal at any time t. And in particular, this implies that also um, the stationary state of this master equation, which is not unique and generally not a thermal state, even if you have a thermal environment, um, will have this block diagonal structure. Now you can prove an even stronger statement and that's not part of the literature, as far as I'm aware, at least. So that's um, one of the little contributions that we made here. So if we now consider this master equation that I just showed you, and we require some cryptic condition here, which I don't have time to explain in detail, just so much. This condition basically means that we want our bath to couple to sufficiently many transitions in our atoms so that there are no invariant subspaces other than those implied by permutation invariance. That means, for instance, if you have a four-level atom and you connect only two of these states pairwise so that you have two disconnected pairs, then this condition would be violated. If you introduce a third transition so that this entire network is connected, then this condition is generally met. That's basically what it means. So and under this condition, one can show that the stationary state of this master equation will always have this block diagonal form, no matter if it is initial, initially permutation invariant or not. That means all the off diagonal blocks in this Schrovile representation will go to zero under the dynamics generated by this master equation. But then you have some prefactors in this decomposition, and these prefactors depend on the initial condition. 
um, if uh, the initial state is per permutation invariant, then they are one, but otherwise they can be anything. In addition, you can show that if your, your rate matrix satisfies beta balance, then the stationary states inside every lambda block will be thermal states, Gibbs states. Cool. So now that we have that, um, we can have a closer look at these um, stationary states. So now we assume we have a thermal environment, and that means we have a stationary state of this form. If we want to now calculate the um, expectation value of some permutation invariant observable, um, we just have to multiply these two things and take a trace. And it turns out in the end, all that you need to know is the probability to occupy a certain lambda block, which is set by the initial condition, and then the average value of the lambda block of the observable O with the corresponding thermal state in this block. And now you can, for instance, go and calculate the internal energy. And it turns out that um, you can write this as a weighted sum over the derivative with respect to beta of the log of the partition function in this individual block. So this is not the partition function of the entire system, which would be trivial. This is just the partition function um, in one of these irreducible blocks. And it's, I mean, this quantity is generally not straightforward to come by, but there's another trick to do that. Um, and one can calculate the C lambda without having to actually calculate the sure basis, so without actually having to generate this block diagonal form. And this can be done by, by Wilde's character formula. I don't really want to go into the details. Um, the only thing that's important here is this character formula gives you a means of calculating these partial partition functions without having to calculate the sure basis. Yeah? And then you can write it down explicitly for SU2, and then you get a well-known result. And then you can also write it down for SU3. And as you see, these expressions expand rapidly, but you have explicit expressions in principle for any number of levels. So now we have everything together. Now we can actually start calculating things. Um, so, I mean, we, once you have these, these partial partition functions, you can calculate more things than internal energy. It's just the quantity that I focus here on uh, for the sake of illustration. So let's do that um, because I wanted to show at least one plot. Um, so here we have done a, a little calculation um, that could not have been done with a spin ensemble. So we consider a, a quantum auto cycle. We have an ensemble of three level atoms and we initially prepare the system because we have to set the initial condition. Yeah, Even if we have some fixed driving protocol, the stationary state of this master equation is not unique. So everything will depend on the initial condition. Well, we assume that the entire ensemble is initially thermalized at some inverse temperature beta naught. And then we choose a single particle Hamiltonian, which has this funny structure here. And what that does is essentially, it keeps the overall level splitting between the ground state and the highest excited state constant. And this parameter delta changes the relative position of the intermediate level. And now you can run this ensemble through an auto cycle. That means you couple it to a hot temperature bath. And this is now done through this uh, collective master equation. Yeah? So the system does not go to an equilibrium state. But nonetheless, you can inject heat in this way. And then we can compress this entire spectrum by a certain um, the compression ratio kappa. And in this way, extract work from the system. Then you couple to a hot, uh, cold bath and you extract heat from the system. And then you have to expand again to close the cycle. But because you have cooled the system down before, that costs now less work then you have extracted in the second strip. So that's an auto cycle. And the advantage of the auto cycle is that you can calculate everything just by taking differences between internal energies, assuming that the relaxation process um, in the thermal strokes is complete. So we wait a long time. And we also assume that these uh, mechanical processes where we compress and expand the spectrum are essentially instantaneous. So it's an idealized model. Um, and it's really just here for the sake of illustration. Yeah? And now one can make some plots. So this is now um, for seven particles. All of this has been analytically calculated. Um, and what you see here is um, the network output. So that's W out minus W in. 
um, as a function of this parameter delta. And for comparison, the dashed lines show exactly the same quantity for an ensemble of, um, for a not permutation invariant ensemble where every individual atom really formalizes. And what we see is, well, um, we can apparently extract more work with these permutation invariant uh, ensembles than with the standard um, case where every um, atom is essentially independent. And also we find that these curves are monotonically increasing with delta. That means we get the maximum work output in a situation where the excited state is degenerated and the ground state is non-degenerated. So that's just one illustration of, of things that one can now do with this formalism. And there's plenty of more things um, that can now be explored. And that brings me to my conclusions. It turns out this entire um, mechanism is very useful um, to do asymptotic analysis. So here's just one example. I mean, we have, we have quite a few of those. If you prepare the system initially in a thermal state, some temperature beta naught, and then you formalize it through this collective master, well, don't formalize it, but you bring it to a new steady state uh, through this collective master equation. Now we assume that the beta naught is very large, so the initial temperature is very low, and the beta of our bath is very high, so the um, is very is very small, so the final temperature is very high, that's how it means. Then in the, in the limit where n is very large, the internal energy of the stationary state scales like square root n. So that's a non-extensive quantity, which shows you that this is really not an equilibrium state anymore. And that's universal, yeah, for any number of levels. Yeah, You have a prefactor which depends on uh, the dimension of the underlying symmetry group, i.e. for all practical purpose, the number of levels, but the scaling is universal. And you, you can find several of such examples. Yeah? And this funny plot down here, which I don't really want to explain in full detail, basically shows a difference in uh, free energy during this relaxation process. So you can actually calculate other things than energy um, for six-dimensional systems. So you can really go to relatively high dimensions here. Future work, I mean, this would be now um, hopefully relatively straightforward to, to use the, this formalism to analyze heat transport problems yeah, because none of the mathematical results really hinges on the fact that you have a single temperature so one can couple to several baths. One could try and do the same thing with, uh, with time-dependent driving, um, flocal and blood equations, for instance. And then, of course, at some point, it would be desirable to talk about interactions. And in principle, it's doable because most of what I showed you just hinges on the fact that you have permutation invariance. But then once you have interactions, you usually have a dense spectrum and then the rotating wave approximation and um, becomes questionable and it's no longer really clear um, if we can use this Lindblad equations. Presumably not. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to, to think about. So I think I'm in time, right? Yes, you are. Brilliant. Very, very punctual. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Kay? I once again encourage uh, students to uh, be brave. My, um, my main question um, would be, um, as someone who, who, who has no uh, real intuition for the sort of quantum ideas that are coming up here, do, do any of these ideas transfer over to a sort of a classical uh, uh, framework? Like if we were, if, can you imagine an analog of these sort of things in, if we were dealing with a molecular, like a, a biophysics system with something undergoing classical transitions between states? Does it, is it very reliant on a, this, this peculiar state that you've got in the middle that you can only get in a quantum setting or is that something you can recreate? No, yeah, okay. I mean, the, the mathematical statements are in the end statements about matrices, yeah? Yeah. Um, from a physical point of view, I'm, I'm, I, I would have doubt that there is any analog in a, in a classical Markov jump process because this is phenomena like superradiance 
hinge on the fact that it's possible to have coherence between different right, yeah, yeah that's what I, that's what i was thinking yeah yeah so, so that's presumably i mean there, but there there is probably some analog with classical wave phenomena that wouldn't surprise me um but i'm not um aware of anything specific but it's always a bit dangerous to claim that something is g9 quantum i mean if, if one tries hard enough it's usually possible to find a classical analog right right but what you're saying is that the 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 analysis you've done at least is very embedded in the, the coherence and so on is very important to yeah it. i mean this is where it comes from the motivating question came really from from the super radiance phenomenon and um the fact that it is almost always really done with two level systems um and it would just be interesting to see um we can write down a similar formalism for for more complicated systems and it turns out we can and much of the theory is borrowed from high energy physics really yes yes um uh anybody anybody else this is the uh the challenge of moving moving from a quantum day <laughs> yeah yeah i i i i realize I, I ended up in the wrong session but that's my fault yeah well the good news is that all the talks are recorded so that anyone um I believe so that they'll be made available after the session. Um, so, digging then a bit into the the future research, um, perhaps you can elaborate a bit on what you expect interactions to do, or what's the interesting consequence for heat transport. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of papers now that this. I mean, this this phenomenon of super radiance also translates into very large heat currents yeah that scale with the number of particles squared and and that is known in general yeah that one one has this kind of effect Ken Funo has a paper on this and uh, there was also a recent paper um from another Japanese group so very large very large as a function of the given the number of particles yeah I mean you, you couple presumably Presumably, an experiment is never that many particles doing it, or is it? Or is it a very big number of particles doing it? No, I mean, I mean, you can have a considerable, uh, considerable number of particles. Like, I mean, certainly on the order of tens. Um, okay. But that, that's that, that's not that's not macroscopic, right? That's still. No, no, no. It's not macroscopic. Yeah, but I mean, if if your heat current scales with, I mean, then if, if it, it's ten particles, it already makes a difference. Yeah, if it's yeah. n or n squared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, and and this, the hope would be that one could analyze these these phenomena that have been described previously now um, from this group theoretical perspective and perhaps learn something new. Another thing is really, I mean, time dependent driving. If these Floquet Lindblad equations that are well established um, for few body systems, this should essentially be applicable here as well, and then one can do like these these multi level mazes and, and and things like that. Interactions interactions are tricky, uh, um, and in mean, principle, one can write interactions into these Hamiltonians, and the mathematical structure still holds as long as everything is permutation invariant. But one could imagine some sort of all to all interaction. The problem is more the Lindblad part, um, because we usually I mean, to get the Lindblad equation, in the end, one has to apply a rotating wave approximation. And right. that hinges on the fact or on the assumption that um, levels are well separated. So the spectrum is sparse. Um, so that fast oscillating terms can be canceled. And if you have interactions, then usually you have a dense spectrum. And then this is no longer really possible. But would you... You would still work in some kind of approximation where you're talking about energy levels you wouldn't be doing density functionals or anything anything like that no no no, no not 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 at this level no no okay no, we've got a couple of questions from the um audience so Tavira if you could unmute thank you um uh, thank you for a very nice talk I have a question so this phenomenon of uh, this uh, square scaling with n, you had to build your system with identical units. Have you tried, have you looked at what happens when you have some disorder if the units are not identical? 
Yeah, if there is a little bit of uh, deviation from this exact degeneracy, what happens then to this effect? Yeah, okay. I mean, it it, it critically hinges on, on the fact that the, the system is permutation invariant. So I would I would think that if if the individual units of your system are really different, um, then the, the behavior will change qualitatively. But then if there's a little bit of disorder that can be treated perturbatively, um, I think it should not change anything qualitatively. I mean, superradiance has been observed in experiments and the experiments are never perfect. Yeah. So there's always a little bit of disorder. So I would, I mean, we haven't looked into that if that uh, was the question, but I would assume that a little bit of disorder doesn't do qualitatively very much, um, at least to the physics, but I would be afraid that the mathematical apparatus explodes. Okay, thank you. We had one other question. Uh, the person has lowered their hand. I don't know if it was the same question. Um, I can't remember who it was. Um, okay, well, um, any other questions, of course, follow up via email or via the direct message in the chat. Let us thank Kay again uh, for kicking thank off this afternoon much. session. And let us.